Uh, hello. So, welcome to my Lightning Talk. First off, I would like to thank uh, thank Code Weavers for making it possible for me to be here and host this lovely event for you. So, I'm Arek and I'm one of the IGT maintainers, and this is my annual IGT update. So, uh, first off, uh, i915 perf was pinned into a library that like installs along with IGT. So, if you want to use anything for i915 performance uh, metering, you can use that library. Uh, IGT Core also has a new thing called IGT Upward, so uh, maybe a little bit of a background of what IGT is. It's a set of tests and tools to aid DRM driver development. So IGT Upward is a way for you to uh, upward the execution of the whole uh, test run from inside of a test when you detect a normal condition. So normally we upward execution on wedges or other Contains that are serious enough, and uh, this allows you to detect those conditions from the test. And if you uh, find something that, like, okay, the test probably shouldn't run past that point because machine is in some weird state, you can use it. Uh, there are a couple of notable test additions, like we have KMS write back tests in IGT right now, and also uh, recently there was a sync object timeline tests added. Uh, in the last year, we uh, worked on Chameleon reliability quite a bit. And uh, and uh, sorry, Martin threw me off. Uh, so Chameleon reliability work. Uh, Chameleon is a display emulator made by Google, and it has uh, and it has uh, like uh, serves as a display, and we can like fake the IDs, read the pixels of it. The issue is with other tests. So if you're using uh, that Chameleon as a normal display, and if it's not in a known working state. You can have other tests flip-flopping. Like if your test requires two, three screens and Camilum is like the second screen, then if it's not up, then your test results will be thrown off. So uh, we added a lot of things to make sure that Camilum is actually up at the beginning of each test uh, that touches, touches display and to make sure that it's in a working condition. If not, then we use the before mentioned IGT upward to abort the whole execution saying like, hey, Camilum is uh, faulty, please, please take a look at it. Uh, there was a lot of coordinated effort to optimize the test suite execution time. So we started tracking how long it does it take uh, to execute certain tests. And if something was running over that threshold, we tried hard to like clamp it down, either by limiting the number of iterations or just instead of using iterations, uh, using uh, the time criteria. Uh, also, we switched the uh, kernel self-test harness, so you can use IGT to run uh, DRM in 9.15 self-tests. Uh, to uh, to uh, get the, those test results in like piglet format, and now it uses the new infrastructure inside of IGT, which is called dynamic sub sub tests. So this is something for enumerating uh, enumerating the tests on the runtime because classical tests have to be machine independent. So you can enumerate them on any machine, and they have to just like worst scenarios worst case scenarios keep. And uh, kernel self-test are kernel dependent. So depending on which kernel you have deployed, uh, you may have certain ha uh, you may have certain tests or not. So like having to change that each time in IGT would be a little bit cumbersome. Uh, also, we now have multi GPU over tests, and uh, does dash dash device selector can select multiple GPUs. And we have sample tests that uses that new API, which is KMS Prime. So you can select which two devices you want to test Prime between. Uh, other than that, we have better assets for invalid nesting of magic control blocks. So IGT depends on magic control blocks like IGT subtest, IGT skip, IGT assert. And there are a couple of ways uh, that are like there are multiple ways which you can nest one inside of the other, but there are also plenty of invalid uh, nesting scenarios. And we now loudly assert uh, on those and print a message explaining what went wrong. Uh, we also have better kernel module param handling, so some of the tests want to override some of the kernel parameters. And we have now like a generic framework in place that allows you to store the original kernel settings, mangle them a little bit, do some testing, and restore the original state. Uh, we have also threading in tests. So uh, asserts from threads launched from inside of the test were causing a lot of very weird failures, like uh, uh, Basically, the thread was jumping into something it shouldn't jump, and there were confusing errors all over the place. Now it's safe to use asserts inside of uh, threads, and uh, IGT skip and require are not allowed, and we just assert on them like using the standard assert to, to exit execution early and complain to the user. 
Uh, another thing, a couple of improvements in IGT Runner. Uh, so we have a per test timeout. So this was used in the execution time optimization effort uh, to, to do hunt the tests that are taking too long. Uh, we have more reliable output. There are a bunch of sync points added and making sure that we actually write the uh, results back to the disk. And we introduced a switch to enable this usage limit. That's quite a lot for a year. And thanks for thinking by. And that's it for my talk. Thanks. Hi, hello everyone. Um, I'm Pierre-Lou Griffet. I work uh, for Valve on most things Linux. And uh, today I'll talk a little bit about Gamescope and uh, updates on its development and show a couple of quick demos. Uh, a little bit about myself. In 2007, I started being involved with the Linux graphics stack, mostly on graphics drivers at the time. Um, in 2012, I joined Valve uh, to work on the initial Linux port of the source engine and the Steam client. Did lots of OpenGL performance work, uh, worked on kicking off Steam OS, uh, and then later things like Vulkan, SteamVR for Linux. In the past couple of years, I've worked a lot on uh, setting up all of our external uh, open source project contributions. Um, some of it uh, you might have seen today uh, around the, the Mesa project and, and maybe in the coming days at the event as well. Um, so a quick update on Gamescope. So what is Gamescope? Gamescope is essentially the continuation of Steam Comp Manager. Uh, it's, a, it's a rewrite, refactor of, of Steam Comp Manager to be based on Wayland instead of GLX. Uh, so Steam Comp Manager was the, or still is, the, the GLX-based uh, compositing window manager at the core of the SteamOS gaming shell. So it either presents Steam or a single game in a full screen way, uh, you know, nicely uh, scaled up with uh, pillar boxing or letter boxing if needed, vsync, all that kind of, or you know, what we call the appliance-like session. Um, so by uh, by moving over to Wayland uh, and XWayland, we're able to basically do the same thing and display a single game running in that in that XWayland instance. But uh, we more directly assume the role of the like what would be the responsibility of the DDX by back then, and we get to you know then decide what we do with the incoming app buffers, and you know either short circuit any sort of graphics and go directly to uh, DRM display output, or you know if we need to composite something, um, the new code uses uh, Vulkan only, um, so that by using Vulkan Compute, uh, we're actually able to schedule any work needed on the on the async uh, compute ring of the hardware, if it, the hardware does support that, which is pretty useful in, in some situations. Uh, it's also optimized for latency, so uh, it's trying. It tries to be very aware of the underlying vBlank timing of, of the output display device when it's running in that direct DRM embedded uh, embedded uh, mode, and tries to you know align the game's rendering to that and uh, decide. W which of the most recent buffers composite or, or display at a, a tight date deadline before before the next vBlank. Uh, so that's the basic kind of rendering loop here. You see vBlanks are the you know the vertical purple bars. Uh, this is running on AMD hardware, so we're able to use that that real time uh, compute capability in that separate hardware ring. Uh, here you see the game running. Sekiro is very uh, intensive for the system apparently because it's keeping the GPU completely busy. But despite that, we're able to, uh, you know, get scheduled at our budget before vBlank, sneak in some compute work, even though the GPU is completely busy, and still make our make our frame there. Uh, so for the whole Wayland aspect of it, uh, I use WL roots. Uh, seemed to be a pretty quick starting point, and to fit our needs as far as, uh, you know, not having too high level of an abstraction, because I, I knew that there's some parts of it we would need to completely stub out and replace with our own such as the whole output portion with uh, you know graphics and uh, and the window manager as well where we substitute uh, WL roots with our own window manager still based on the the uh, previous steam comp manager code base uh, so you know once I managed to hack around uh, these mismatches uh, it was pretty painless um, I started from uh, Rootston, which was, I guess, an example compositor based on WL Roots. Had a nice disclaimer at the top saying, you know, under no circumstances you should fork this and create your own compositor from it. So I did that. Uh, and then, you know, once that was up and running, um, merged it with the Steam Comp Manager code base, 
and then started to uh, plumb the output pipeline of Steam Comp Manager to uh, to Wayland by you know putting my own sideband to export the DMA buffs from from Wayland. And once that was run, running, uh, I just had to remove the rootstone part of it to get back to you know a normal size and uh, and the bare bones functionality. So you know in that in that intermediate uh, state, it looked a little bit like that where it had both the rootstone window showing a more traditional desktop and or more like managed scale nicely presented uh, output window uh, which was pretty interesting um, so as part of developing it uh, you know I was mostly using a, a desktop session because uh, you know Wayland and, and its compositors usually have some sort of nested support where you can just run them on a normal desktop uh, and you know was mostly using that as a development tool because it was convenient but I was, I was, I was running through that stuff, realized that, you know, the same architecture, the same code base could actually let us achieve some of our goals around uh, doing the same sort of input-output manipulation of the existing, pre-existing game without modifying the game, uh, but applying that to a more general Linux desktop, which was really interesting. Um, so, you know, it seemed like we could hit two walls with one stone here, which... Uh, which, you know, I tried to pursue some more and added some uh, initial features to see, you know, what we could get out of that nested uh, desktop use case uh, instead of uh, just focusing only on the embedded one. And I'm going to show uh, some of my takeaways there. Um, I mean, the initial thing that it obviously does is to abstract away, you know, all the size of the output. So, you know, if you have a game, you're able to put it full screen and, uh, you know, and... and that's pretty straightforward. Uh, it's it's nothing that Steam Comp Manager couldn't do. Uh, but say you have an ultra wide screen here. You know, I put my my monitor in its native 21 by 9 mode. Um, some old games will probably not do the right thing when uh, faced with these kind of modes. Newer ones support them just fine in in most cases, or at least have a fallback to you know 16 by 9 with pillar box. Uh, but some older games will just never be made to work well there. Uh, so here, you know, is Portal. Uh, you can you get to pick your poison in there, but no matter what you pick, it's not going to work quite the way you'd expect, and not give you, you know, both full screen and not broken rendering. Uh, but if you run it through Gamescope, which is a very easy command line, just append or prepend Gamescope with 2560 height 1440 to uh, you know make its internal display uh, a 16 by 9, uh, and pointing the game at that, so it runs in that little uh, sandbox. Uh, you know, then as far as the game's concerned, it's running on a single 16 by 9 display, and then all of the output transformation around, you know, putting these pillar boxes around the rendering, and overlaying the rest is done through Gamescope. Uh, so it works more as you'd expect there, and you know, latency is good and all that. Um, similar situation on uh, multi-screen uh, scenarios like multi-monitor. Uh, you know, some games will either get endlessly confused by multi-monitor configurations and just pick one display and be insistent that they need to full screen to that one and then not react well when you forcefully uproot them and put them to the other display. Uh, or some games, you know, if you have like a portrait display and a landscape display, some games will get very confused by, you know, the overall desktop resolution and all that. If you run it through Gamescope, as far as the game's concerned, it has one display. It has no way of hurting itself there. Uh, so you can just, you know, unfull screen it through Gamescope, drag it to your other display, and there you go. Uh, it solves that whole class of issue as well. Um, it can do some interesting things ar around refresh rate as well. Uh, so by default, you know, I can run this uh, GLX Gears OpenGL benchmark, and it'll it'll naturally pass through my host desktop refresh rate of here 100 hertz to the app. So it's running at, at 100 hertz right now. But uh, should I decide to, I can just tell it to fake it and, uh, you know, uh, run it at a, at a refresh rate of 30 hertz, which, uh, you know, can be useful in some cases if you need to cap an application. Um, and some ad hoc tools have existed to do that for, you know, a long time where you can just hook to a variety of graphics APIs and try to get the same thing going. But here it's a nice general solution and work across the board. Uh, and then, you know, you can imagine more quality of life type features where here, you know, I have this mode where um, it limits the refresh rate, but only if the GameScop window is out of focus. So here it's running at my native, you know, 100 when I'm trying to interact with the app. And then as soon as I hold tab, it's throttling down to 10 FPS. Uh, so, you know, say you're gaming on a laptop and you want to, 
uh, you know, have your laptop get a little bit cooler if you need to alt tap from the game or, you know, not be burning all that battery life, you, you know, maybe you, could, you can do that now. Um, the fact that it uh, has this unified Vulkan-based output pipeline in the nested scenario is pretty interesting too. Uh, it means that you can, you know, for example, uh, use the VK Basalt uh, post-processing Vulkan layer on a variety of applications that it would otherwise not support. Um, so, for example, here I can run it with GLX gears um, and, you know, make use of, of its CRT filter that would only uh, apply to Vulkan apps normally. And in conjunction with Gamescope's own feature of, you know, disabling filtering and doing that nearest neighbor filtering, you can get this nice retro output going there. Um, same idea, you know, you can just uh, extend that to uh, core rendering as well uh, because, um, you know, everything goes through that same output pipeline. So, you know, it's general solutions to things that were previously hacked together and uh, I think it, it could, be, could be pretty convenient if exposed properly with a nice UI. Um, so, I mean, there's still some work to do. Definitely more polish around that nested experience, like that's just starting at this point. Uh, mimic more the game window, pass through the window title, window icon, a couple of different things that, you know, would just make it act more as you'd expect as the user. Um, of course, we need NVIDIA support as well. Like, it, you know, it works on Mesa drivers right now, but uh, all, all of the NVIDIA stuff is off limits because of its reliance to x right now. Uh, on the embedded kind of core use case, we really need uh, to be able to make more use of DRM planes when possible. Uh, and you know, right now it's mostly not possible give before uh, because of kernel bugs, but it's it's one of the main things that still forces us to composite when we have uh, additional layers, uh, you know, on top of the game's rendering. Uh, there's a couple of I think high level takeaways. We really need modifiers. Like right now we're uh, you know we're uh, focusing on the Vulkan case because we're running the same Vulkan driver on the compositor side and the client app side in the in the you know in the the most common case you care about. So we can, uh, we, you know, we can get optimal rendering or optimal surface layout there, and, and just have it have it match by chance. But for uh, for OpenGL, for example, we have to disable all the internal driver compression optimizations and all that, because otherwise our rendering would be garbled. And uh, having modifiers plumbed everywhere is, is really needed there. Uh, implicit sync's not ideal. Uh, it, it'd be better, I think, if we got an explicit fence uh, if we wanted it. That uh, we could even wait on the GPU. Uh, that would be that would be best. Uh, there's a bunch of bugs in display drivers on the kernel side. Uh, I don't think that's news to anyone. Anytime you're uh, you know the, going off the the well-trodden path of uh, you know just doing a native resolution, main plane scan out, you run into issues. Um, and and so I, I'm sure we'll run into more of them. And hopefully that'll be a forcing function to get some of that stuff fixed. Uh, it'd be really nice to get tighter control over the application's rendering cadence so that we could, uh, you know, do further things to align its frame, uh, it, you know, the, the application frames to vBlank and reduce latency even further. Uh, there's some hacks we can do right now, but it'd be nice to have a real mechanism to dictate when things like swap buffers or acquire next image returns so we could meter it uh, really accurately. And uh, yeah, that's mostly it. I uh, didn't have tons of time, so I tried to uh, uh, you know, go through it quickly, but let me know if you have more questions and uh, check out the project. Uh, it should work pretty well on desktop today, at least on AMD hardware. Intel's probably not too far off from working as well. Thank you. Okay. Um, so, Dorota, I you know, think you're live and uh, you can take it from there. Apparently, the sharing is not working nicely. Uh, maybe we can exchange. James, uh, would you be ready for your talk? Yes, in theory. One second here.
I'm going to present briefly on the Vulcan presentation timing um, extension that we've recently made public on GitHub. Uh, so some history here. Uh, the, the, the extension that we're working on now evolved from the Google display timing extension that's already public. Um, it has the, the same fundamental features. I'm not, I'm not going to try to go into the motivations behind why we're doing this or, or what exactly it has, but just briefly, it allows applications to provide a target presentation time whenever they present a buffer. So when you call VKQ present, you can say, I want it to happen actually at this absolute time or this relative time. Um, that's also under debate. Uh, and you can also query when past presents completed or when they actually landed on the screen. Um, Ideally, meaning when the pixels were actually visible to the user, whatever that means for your target display. Oh, did it go away? Let me share my whole screen. That working? Okay. Um, okay. So yeah, I was going over the first line there. Um, so we wanted to standardize this functionality in, in Kronos. Um, so we started in an effort to develop a Kronos ratified extension based on the the basic functionality from display timing. Um, we added various bits of functionality along the way. Uh, we added support for variable refresh rate displays and how to report them, how to operate on them differently. Um, we added additional time domains. So for example, uh, the Google Display Timing uh, extension, I believe only supports clock monotonic raw as a time domain. Um, to support Windows, we added the query performance counter time domain. And we also added a swap chain local time domain that was required to be the right default. And that would be um, a timestamp value that is only relevant within that uh, swap chain. So this is useful if you have uh, displays that are potentially, in fact, remote displays, or if you have a, a clock for your display engine that's only um, available on your GPU and it's hard to convert it you know, to other time domains on the system. Um, we added negotiation, uh, a rather complex mechanism to negotiate raising or lowering frame rates where the driver can be given hints that the application wants to boost up clocks to jump up to a higher frame rate after potentially falling back to a lower frame rate in the past. Um, and then that driver in turn will hint back to the application when the GPU is ready to handle that. Um, so we, we did a lot of work here. Uh, it was a lot of, took a lot of time to develop, you know, these features, they're relatively complex. But at some point we ran into some problems, um, namely that we had only intermittent attention from IHVs and ISVs. Um, so this, this all started off with some good attention from various people giving input and de doing development and getting feedback on hardware. But at some point, interest, interest would kind of wane, or different groups would have different priorities going in different directions. So we really struggled to get the, the level of feedback necessary to validate our methodologies, which were um, honestly much more researchy in nature than other stuff we've usually done in Kronos. Um, at the same time, right around when this was kind of losing interest internally, some of us noticed that at, at XDC 2019 last year, there was a lot of there were a lot of talks on things that were related to presentation timing. Um, people doing custom VR compositors or their own custom system compositors even that needed very accurate display timing to behave well. Um, so a few of us thought that you know, it might be beneficial to make this public, both to spur development interest and to be able to get more validation and more input from a, a broader group of people. Um, so we went through a, a very long process in Kronos actually to convert this into an EXT extension um, re remove any NDA components of it and make it all public. Um, and as of Monday, it's public on GitHub now. I can't change slides. So now that it's up there, uh, patches are welcome. Please contribute. Please read the spec. Please do whatever you can with anything public like that. Um, send pull requests, point out typos or anything trivial, or make high-level suggestions. Um, we do have some specific requirements regarding contributions to, to keep the option open to make this a Kronos ratification, ratified extension later on. Um, but for right now, the goal is just to make an EXD uh, multi-vendor extension that wouldn't have any special Kronos uh, protections. 
Um, so see, see, the, see the pull request that has some details on how to contribute in the description there. Um, some ideas for contributions include you know, implementing your favorite driver window system or whatever. Um, if it's difficult or not possible to do that for some reason, definitely let us know. We're trying to make it compatible as widely as possible. Um, also, you know, write support for it in your app, toolkit, game, media player, VR compositor, or whatever, anything that you use for presentation. Um, again, if that's difficult or not possible, let us know why. Um, one caveat here is if you're going to write support for this in drivers or applications, it would be best if you somehow hit it from being enabled by default because the API is not final. Um, this is an under development specification, not an extension release. Uh, so, so the API will probably change and it would break apps once we change that or break old drivers in the future. Um, so just leave it off by default. But you know, other than that, go, go wild. Uh, if there's any questions, let me know. Yeah, let's keep the questions for uh, a bit later, uh, maybe uh, at the end of all the lightning talks. And um, yeah, so that's it. Oh, Dorota, do you mind trying again? Of course. Uh -huh. there we go. Uh, okay, thank you, thank you, Martin, for introducing me. Uh, I am Dorota. I've been specializing uh, in Wayland recently, and I've been trying to uh, push input method support in Wayland for a while. And this is just uh, the newest update. A quick recap: What is an input method? It's when you enter text. When a human controls a tool to communicate to some software in order to produce text and send it to an application, this is an input method. Traditionally, it has been a separate subsystem from the keyboards and used mostly for uh, languages from the Chinese family, like uh, two, two versions of Chinese and the Japanese kana, but it's uh, not just that. So in Wayland, we have three protocols for that. One is text input, which is the base, and the other two are input method and virtual keyboard, which allow third-party applications to connect to that system. Um, those are the three ones that they try to get right, but things don't always go right, so I'm just going to tell you about the failures that they had. The first problem was about key maps and with virtual keyboard. Uh, when we have a virtual keyboard and a real keyboard, and both of them have different key maps, we might want to press a modifier on one and the key on another. But which key map decides the outcome? This is a problem without a clear solution at this moment. There's another problem with virtual keyboard. Um, input events, which come from lib input, uh, which are related to real devices, carry timestamps. And timestamps are used to ensure the correct ordering of events. But the clock is not very clearly specified in Wayland, so it's not sure how the virtual devices would send their own timestamps. A solution is in progress. Another problem is related to text input, the core protocol, and it's about deletion. If we want to delete a character, the application tells us what's already written in the text field, so we can count bytes and delete as many as needed. Great. Uh, no, not so great. Uh, the application is not forced to tell the what the text field contains because I made this optional in the protocol. So we don't always know how many bytes to delete, and we can not actually delete things properly. And this is getting fixed in the next revision. So those are the, the most important problems right now, but there are more problems that I have already been told about, and there are more problems that are certainly going to pop up in the future. So if you're interested in that kind of stuff, you should join the discussion on the Wayland Protocols mailing list and on the GitLab instance and try to help with that. And you can also try reading my blog or talking to me on IRC because I, I blog about those topics um, sometimes. Yeah, uh, thanks. That would be it. Thank you, Dorota. And finally, we have Alisa. Uh, 
Hello. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you, but magic. Dorota is still sharing. Or is she? Uh, I'm not, sorry. Okay. Oh, okay. Well, that worked. Right. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, I, I'm here with more witchcraft noises. Ooh, uh, I wasn't really rehearsing my witchcraft noises. I'm sorry. This was supposed to be a lot more suave. Anyway, the product of reverse engineering is uh, very ad hoc. You have a number of um, bits and pieces understood along with an, an other bits and pieces that aren't so understood. And sometimes you have very clear code, uh, such as the type that you'd see with drivers that are based on official documentation. And other times you have code that has to do an XXX three times in the same comment because you're just moving some magic field, some magic number into some other magic field. And I mean, it works. I'm presenting from my Pantfrost laptop, um, but it's not ideal and it's not the sort of sustainable code quality that uh, we would like to see. So the question is, what do you what do you do when all of a sudden you want to transition your driver from ad, based on ad hoc reverse engineering to potentially being based on much more solid foundations? Um, how do you all of a sudden refactor your entire driver to have all of the hardware specific code uh, renamed and fixed? And in addition, if you have debug tooling such as disassemblers or command stream decoding tools, uh, suddenly having those all rewritten and uh, re-engineered to be based on new foundations. Um, this is a problem which uh, perhaps Panfrost has faced uh, or is facing. And uh, I've had, one of the solutions for us has turned out to be moving to more auto-generated tooling. On the data structure side, the command stream side, um, it is very helpful to focus on moving away from just ad hoc bit fields to using tools like GenXML or NVTools, which a number of drivers are already doing. Um, if you look at the difference between manually uh, packing fields into a, a pack struct versus these very nice generator functions you'll see in the Intel or V3D drivers, um, that's uh, something that the drivers we would ideally like to uh, replicate. So, use, so in our case, we switched to GenXML for the data structure side, and that is uh, in progress. On the compiler side, it's not as not as clear cut how to handle this because com compiler development, um, the instruction sets can often be much more uh, irregular than you would see on the data structures. And so, GenXML, for instance, would not work for the Bifrost instruction set, which we have been uh, focusing on for this refactor. Uh, to this end, what we can still use a XML generator-based solution. And from the, a given uh, XML description of the instruction set, we can generate a disassembler for the instruction set, which handles every instruction with every modifier, as well as a uh, helpers to efficiently pack all the instructions at the last stage of the compiler. Uh, so this work is uh, well underway for Bifrost. And indeed, the code has now uh, landed in Mesa, or is landing, as in the in the past few minutes. And if I share my screen, um, which I'll have to remember how to do on Jitsi, not really not used to this whole online conference thing yet, but we'll get there. <laughs> um, uh, we have this uh, merge this merge request um, to rewrite our disassembler and the instruction packing to be canonical. Um, and here's Lightning Talk. And if we look at the actual source code for here, uh, we have a very streamlined descript descriptive version of the instruction set going through all the different instructions method, uh, methodically sorted uh, with our exact fields, which are a generalization of opcodes, as well as all the different modifiers that you might have. And altogether, a series of Python scripts that can run in the uh, build system, just like we do for GenXML, is able to uh, generate everything we need. And uh, so the net result is that we are well on our way to having uh, uh, turning Panfrost into a stable, uh, very clean code base, which will be ready for serious Bifrost work going forward. 
I'm assuming there are questions in the chats. 